Thank you so very much. And thank you for everyone's patience uh, today for staying on for this panel and for my very last paper of the day. So what I'm going to be presenting today is effectively a composite of several recent papers that are going to form the nucleus of a proper article uh, that I hope to soon put together, perhaps even as part of the uh, proposed edited volume uh, for this symposium, maybe. Some of the ground that I'm going to be covering may be familiar to those of you who have seen me present recently, but I'm also going to share some new thoughts as well as I iterate my practice and learn from the conversations it generates. Indeed, I've learned quite a bit today already, um, but I also think this may be one of the most sceptical forums for my work that I've yet presented at, so I'm going to be quite interested here. So to start with then, I want to share a question with you that has driven much of my creative and critical work over the past five years. And that is, what does it mean to know the world through contemporary technical systems? Specifically, how do we, uh, how do we come to know, how might we come to know the world at a planetary scale via satellites, computers, electronic sensors, and all their enabling infrastructures, both technical and epistemic? Of course, I'm saying we here, but that suggests a universality of sensing and sense making and the agency it precipitates. Human bodily senses are plainly uh, very far from uniform in how they render the world. And it is redundant to note that there are many contingent factors, social, cultural, political, giving shape to what in people's sensory milieus they deem significant and how and to what extent they go about investigating, depicting and communicating that significance both to themselves and to other peoples in their communities and beyond. So with this caveat to the fore then, uh, we can at least note that when it comes to the particularly narrow and overprivileged band of sense making that is the modern Western epistemy, one characteristic that reigns supreme is its ocular centrism. To paraphrase Barney Wharf's neat summary here, Cartesian rationalism was predicated on the distinction uh, between and the separation between the inner reality of the mind and the outer reality of objects, with seeing abstracted from all other conditions becoming synonymous with knowing, rendering the emerging surfaces of modernity visible and measurable while leaving their viewer without body or place. Now, this very particular perspective resonated with all manner of contemporary developments, such as the meridian grids imposed by European powers worldwide to facilitate the exchange networks from incipient capitalism, enclosing global space within structures of rationality and control of colonial spatial order. Wolf goes on to describe how this rationalized global sensibility primed the Western epistemy for the subsequent conception and invention of photography as the foremost medium through which a preeminently visual reality could be known, represented, and managed across space and time. Needless to say, this paradigm of technical imaging seeped eventually into the development of myriad other devices for capturing signals from across the electromagnetic spectrum, as well as the means of collating and tabulating these signals into abstracted bodies of data that could be redeployed across different contexts. It is here that we see the basis for the global information architectures that we now characterize as our contemporary modes of sensing, knowing and affecting the world. Emblematic here is the multispectral airborne and satellite imagery that is used for defining, monitoring and managing global space. And it is this global sensory matrix then that has recorded and embedded the force of human collective agency on every aspect of the earth as a planetary entity. And from this has fostered an awareness of interlinked environmental crises across continents, oceans and atmospheres. Nevertheless, despite its undoubted scientific efficacy, this data-driven epistemy and the modes of human agency it precipitates um, have not been without their critics. Karen uh, Lifton is typical here in noting that the Western planetary gaze as a fundamentally visual project reinforces the masculinist, positivist paradigms upon which so many exploitative, extractionist and outrightly imperialist attitudes towards the Earth its flora, fauna and peoples are enabled. Jennifer Gabris notes similarly that it is now not uncommon for the planetary to be invoked in discussions of technology. Technology is seen to overrun and command the planetary. And so perpetuating this historic sense of the earth as being held in a space of complete capture, 
data capture and enclosure, an earth that can be more effectively bent to our agency, an earth that can be programmed. Unsurprisingly, Gabriel reflects on how these totalizing planetary discourses are in fact reducing the possibilities of what the planetary is or might become, of being planetary as a praxis. And so inquires as to whether other forms of planetary media endeavors might be developed to better attend to all that is, which is rendered incommensurate, unjust, or marginalized by contemporary paradigms that are founded on regimentation, automation, and exactitude. This is a complex question, of course, with its implication that simply making statements of relationality between every force, every flow, every formation is not a path in itself towards a better world. So my own creative and critical practices of recent years have effectively followed Gabrice's lead in pursuing this question, which is why I cite her so often. But I'm also following the trails marked out by a range of artists and academics, such as Beatrice de Costa, Sasha Engelman and J.R. Carpenter, who have also examined and enacted similar themes as part of their work. For my part, over the course of several projects, I have developed often elaborate processes that entangle cameras, satellites, drones, web graphics, esoteric code, academic writing, and the printed codex, seeking to investigate what their complex contingent exchanges can reveal about the structures, dynamics, and possibilities of the contemporary environment. The hybrid art texts resulting are thus better understood as being enacted across these elements, and so deriving their creative and critical force as much by encouraging reflection on these varied aspects and processes as the actual markings they leave behind. A particular gesture that characterises my work especially is the use of technologies that are ostensibly focused on the production of images for the production of text to gather photographic data from ecologically provoking scenes, and then using this data to actualize uh, corpus-derived texts into various configurations. So in transforming images to text, my aim is to meditate on the performative multivalency of data itself, to emphasize how specifically visual data is rendered as such, and is not a straightforward window onto the world. It can thus become, be articulated in different ways so as to become prehensible and that the predominant modes such as colour coded diagrams and visualisations are not the only means available. Moreover, textual parsing does not simply substitute one mode of representation for another as to provide a way of invoking contexts and frames of reference and understanding beyond what is suggested ostensibly by the image as a purely visual formation, because they are indeed crucial for shaping its perception and interpretation. Given the critical role played by ocular paradigms of sensing and knowing the world in Western technoscience and its characterization as rendering transparencies through which to capture rather than in fact perform the observable, dwelling critically and creatively on the latter aspect is something that I think is especially important. To illustrate all that I'm sort of talking with you here today, um, I would like to detail just one project, uh, which is entitled Landform. This project has only just emerged into what may might be characterized as a functioning prototype, so there is still some measure of development yet to go. Nevertheless, it is sufficiently complete to give you a sense of what I'm aspiring to do and to achieve here. Landform is a project that involves taking landscapes photograph from the vantage point of either a satellite or preferably a low flying camera drone before having these images passed through a program that converts its constituent visual brightness signatures into circuitous diagrammatic visual algorithms. The instructions encoded within these algorithms are then executed with the aid of a specially developed interpreter routine and this composes generative texts that draw from the vocabularies of scholarly works discussing ecological concerns. This formation in itself does not manifest as a conventional block of text, but is encoded into what is known as a JSON or JavaScript object notation object. 
uh, which is a simple data structure constituted of label attribute tags and their associated values. So to unpack more slowly then this highly elliptical undertaking, and here is an illustration of each stage in the process that you can see on the screen. So what I want to note with you first of all, that in its prototype iteration, Landform is sourcing its imagery from a series of drone overflights conducted over parts of North Cornwall in the United Kingdom, encompassing a selection of moorland regions and coastal areas. What is captured in the existing footage are sites inscribed by the marks of human activity in various guises, from quarries to runways to mining detritus to the ghosts of Iron Age communities. Despite its official status as an area of outstanding natural beauty with its idyllic implications, there is no area of North Cornwall that does not bear the signs of human settlement, cultivation and extraction. And this affords an apposite uh, domain for capturing the ecological entanglements that are driving landform. Now the transformation of the gathered landscape imagery into generative text is by necessity a complex and multi-stage process. Initially, the digital images are processed by a system that treats them only as an array of grayscale brightness values. These values are then queuing a plotter algorithm that draws across the surface of this grayscale imagery. The coordinates that make up this plot trail, which you can see in the center, are then processed by another routine that treats them as a series of encoded instructions as an elementary programming language. These instructions are then used to navigate and actualize a multi-dimensional data structure that charts the detected relations between different grammatical units in a source corpus of text. The instructions of the visual algorithm effectively specify a series of lookup coordinates, determining which sequences of interrelated words are pulled out of this data structure for composing the final textual formation, which is what you see on the right. Now, the source texts themselves are currently a mixture of academic works that are exploring ecological writing, sensory apparatus, or media materialities. And the work here is that of such as Karen Barrad, Paul Edwards, Sasha Engelman, and Yussi Parika. The creative and critical gesture here is to concretely entangle these texts within the very systems, sensors, and digital apparatus that they explore and critique and thus in turn highlight something of the discourses surrounding these systems concerning how they pass and render the world as knowable and perceivable. So in traversing the domains of land, code and text then, what do I actually hope to achieve with the Landform project? What am I trying to actually do? At one level, I'm hoping, perhaps somewhat grandly, uh, to actualize a new poetics of the sensory as it is expressed through the algorithmic interplay between digital text and digital image. The digital image as a constructed two-dimensional matrix of data values rendered as pixels for the prehension of our eyes is marked ultimately by the, its absolute striations in its neat parceling of sensed light into a rectilinear grid the waves and diffractions of light as a physical phenomenon being passed into an absolute mathematical structure. The terrain signatures that shape the light that enters the camera apparatus has perhaps in one slightly naive sense, no bearing on its actual concrete functioning or the modes of representation it aspires to uphold. And it is thus in one sense, fundamentally indifferent to the landscapes below. Where things change, turn on the sensory assemblage within which the camera apparatus is entangled and the modes of utility to which it is oriented. I think of uh, Harun Faruqi's notion of the operational image here, with contemporary digital images being functionally attuned into the kinds of representations they enact and the information they supply, which more often than not work for the benefit of other machines and algorithmic devices so as to better surveil the world or to direct automatically varied interventions that seek to arrest its unruly flows into structures we can better make sense of and which are in the short term ostensibly better suited for our survival, irrespective of the damage that might be caused in the long term. 
The imagery of military drones and surveillance satellites are particularly stark illustrations of this impulse. But even civilian Earth monitoring enterprises are ultimately justified by and predicated on supporting the decisions and actions of political decision makers and policy designers. So in contrast to this, my hope with Landform is to create a sensory assemblage whose functioning and outputs are enigmatic and denaturalizing of what we expect cameras and code and databases to be. The circuitous movements of the visual algorithms generated from each image aim to restore something of a topographical inscription within the actual functioning of the apparatus. But one that does not pretend to actually capture the landscape below, but to articulate its enacted liminal status within the intersection of multiple material phenomena, technologies and framing discourses. The latter indeed represents the operational impulse encoded by the generated algorithm, which is to actualize another kind of topography of sorts within a database of textual materials, presenting a lexical landscape that is composed out of varied critical rhetorics and vocabularies that are highly critical of unreflexive deployments of sensory systems, even in the name of environmental monitoring and which tend to uphold the kinds of totalizing planetary discourses and visions of enclosure and control that we might deem to be a most unsatisfactory response to the problems that these very paradigms have actually uh, instigated and embedded at every scale of life. The result is something of a performance enacted across a range of means rather than a discrete art object crystallizing as an aspect of its operation, a multi-dimensional electrotopography of sorts uh, that I hope gives us cause for thinking through the varied elements, thresholds and processes that give shape to our digital sensory condition, while through the same gesture, outlining alternative ways that this might be expressed and other kinds of vectors it might embed beyond ones of technical prowess, progress and mastery over a programmable planet. I want to close my uh, paper with you now with a brief caveat. I am painfully aware, especially in forums like today, that digital systems and art uh, are often perceived as being inimical to ecological concerns. The recent exhausting wave of hype surrounding the sale of digital art in the form of blockchain tokens has certainly not helped this image. Moreover, the popular tropes surrounding ecological art tend to be marked by an elementary aesthetic of material forms and the body in the world, of pebbles and driftwood, wind and water, and the entangled patternings of life, as conveyed through the mediums of walking, dancing and touch, drawing and painting, novels and poetry. The popular mode is quiet, naturalistic, beautiful and ostensibly untechnical. By contrast, the intensive energy structures and operations of drones, detectors, data links, databases and digital algorithms do not leap to mind so readily when thinking about ecological matterings. And this, as Gabrice noted earlier, is perhaps because they are seen at some level as weapons of the enemy, the means by which the world is arrested into abstract matrices of command and control just like computers more generally were understood in the 1950s and 1960s. In trying to use digital apparatus creatively to explore ecological concerns, I am very aware of the risk that it will come across only as a frivolous technocentric experiment while the world burns. There is no truly satisfactory answer I could give to this charge. And it does not help that I'm not an especially poetic or eloquent presenter by which to argue persuasively another case. Indeed, the digital world itself is so very rarely any of these things either. Thus, if I was to forward a response, I would gently suggest that the value of my endeavors and work like them is not really the creative outcomes, but the processes undertaken which provide little models, little enactments of Gabrice's grand sounding planetary media, bearing out modes of creativity and an experimental willingness that shall become ever more necessary as we try to cope with the radically severe challenges ahead. Yes, of course, these endeavors 
are not going to save us from environmental catastrophe, certainly not in themselves, but they do serve as a means of keeping alive the spirit of play and experimentation in the teeth of context, processes and technologies that might otherwise seek to preclude them. And so therefore ultimately resist the cycles of cynicism and despair that, mere, that justifies or even merely upholds a destructive predominant a priori. If we follow climate scientist Kate Marvel and perceive courage as the resolve to do well without the assurance of a good ending, then sensory art in the midst of profound ecological crises can serve, I think, as another vehicle of material resistance as we attempt to sense and make sense of our present situation. If digital infrastructures are not going to go away, then I would venture it is worth at least trying to see what else they might yet do, of how they may manifest more gently and not leave them only to the designs of tech evangelists or crypto speculators which I think is Gabrice's uh, ultimate point. I certainly do believe that such work can offer us something more than yet another dolorous assessment and fruitless remonstration of our failings, but instead help to realize afresh the potentials for wonder and the kinds of empathy and humility it generates that may yet be found within our technologies, our environments and the world of which we are part. It is this particular mode of sensing and sense making that I find to be perhaps the most valuable of all. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>